face a challenging threat environment. As a new administration in Congress prepare to come to Washington next month, reconsidering the future of cybersecurity policy and strategy, including information sharing, should be atop the agenda. Today, we're thrilled to be hosting a panel of national cybersecurity experts to examine where we've been and where we need to go. I'll make some brief introductions before we jump into our discussion. First, Maggie Brunner is a pro program director for Homeland Security and Public Safety at the National Governors Association, the bipartisan organization representing the nation's governors. Prior to joining NGA in 2017, Maggie was an associate at the Police Executive Research Forum, where she worked on homeland security issues that affected state and local law enforcement. She's also worked with the Department of Homeland Security's Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. Matthew Eggers is the Vice President for Cybersecurity Policy at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Matt's portfolio includes homeland security and national security issues, including chemical security, biosecurity, and emerging security threats, which he handles on behalf of the Chamber's approximately 300 National Security Task Force members. In 2018, he was selected to be a part of the network, the Washington Post survey of influential people in cybersecurity from across government, the private sector, and the security research community. Next, Mark Montgomery is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense on Democracies, and he's recently served as the executive director for the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, which has played a leading role in shaping federal cybersecurity legislation during the 116th Congress. Mark previously served as policy director for the Senate Armed Services Committee under the leadership of former Senator John McCain. Mark's also served for 32 years in the US Navy as a nuclear trained surface warfare officer, retiring as a rear admiral in 2017. He previously served in the National Security Council. Last, Kathleen Rice Mosier is an adjunct professor at, of law at Notre Dame University. Kathleen provides advice to organizations on issues relating to data privacy, cybersecurity, risk management and compliance with federal laws and regulations. Prior to entering private practice, Kathleen served for 20 years in the federal government, including as counsel to the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, as an assistant general counsel in the FBI's uh, National Security Law Branch, and as assistant uh, U.S. attorney in the Southern District of Florida. Uh, this is a truly um, expert guest, so we're really thrilled to have you all. A programming note for all of our people joining us, we're happy to take questions from the audience as we get into our discussion. Uh, please feel free to submit your questions in the chat. With Mark's presence on the panel and the great success of the Solarium Commission having its recommendations uh, be considered as law and likely to become law before the uh, end of the year, I'm excited to talk about the future of cybersecurity information sharing, including what, uh, what are the outstanding recommendations from the commission that could be considered next year. But I thought it would be helpful to first step back and think about where we were in 2015 and the years that led up to that and, um, and what we've learned since that landmark law has passed. I'm thrilled to have Kathleen here because when I was thinking about this panel and who could help us understand what led to the 2015 law, Kathleen was first in mind. For years, Kathleen, you worked on that legislation for the SSCI staff um, and were involved in, in drafting it um, and shaping what what came to be a law in 2015. I was hoping you could share with us some of your um, thoughts about you know, why that law came to be and some of the challenges you faced in uh, developing it. Sure, thanks Dan, and, and thank you for, uh, for inviting us and for hosting this important discussion. Um, I think uh, Matt Eggers could also speak to some of the pain that we endured for years trying to get uh, cyber information sharing legislation through Congress. Um, but let me take it back uh, several years before 2015. Um, it, it, there were numerous efforts in Congress to try to legislate around the issue of, of cybersecurity, but most of those were very um, committee centric. So armed services would deal with military um, intelligence, uh, the intelligence committees would deal with the intelligence aspects, but nobody was looking across the board and saying, what can, what can we do that might make a difference, not just within the federal government, but for the private sector as well. And uh, in our experience on the intelligence committee, we kept hearing from from organizations, from businesses, telling us that there were barriers to effectively sharing information with each other um, in the form of antitrust um, concerns. And there were concerns about trying to get information back from the government 
um, particularly because of classification issues. So it was with, with that backdrop that members really started digging into this. Um, there was a, a large bill sponsored by Senators Lieberman and Collins that uh, tried to look across a large swath of cybersecurity issues. Um, that bill had a lot of opposition, not just from within Congress, but from within the business community as well, because it imposed government mandates on um, organizations that put DHS in charge of cybersecurity, which a lot of people had concerns about in terms of their capabilities, in terms of their ability to be um, uh, nimble in meeting cybersecurity threats. And uh, the bill also did not put forward a clear path for trying to work with FBI and NSA um, in terms of sharing information, in terms of receiving information, because of concerns that had, origi had orig arisen um, uh, with the leaks from Edward Snowden. So all of that uh, was happening in the 2011, 2012 timeframe. And then um, in order to counter that, a group of ranking members in the Senate uh, led by um, Senator McCain, Senator Chambliss from the Intel Committee decided to put forward a bill that, uh, that tried to address issues that should have been non-controversial. And um, information sharing was part of that. And that bill, Secure IT, ultimately did not get a vote in Congress that year. Um, the Lieberman-Collins bill also failed. So that brought us to 2014. And at that point, Senator Chambliss and Senator Feinstein, who had been on dueling bills, decided that they would at least try to find common ground on information sharing. And that effort to find common ground um, gave rise to the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act that ultimately was enacted in 2015. So um, I was there in the, that last Congress where you were working on this um, in 2013 and 2015. And um, that year, you know, some of us were able to move our bills through. Um, we were able to, we had uh, bills to update federal cybersecurity or FISMA, um, yeah. basically spelling out the lines between OMB and DHS and DHS, helping to sort of scope DHS's emerging role. We also at that time passed in 2014, passed a bill to authorize the NKIC, which sort of later became, would become CISA. Um, but I recall last, at the end of that Congress, um, there was a scramble to try and move the information sharing bill, but it faced a lot of hurdles. Um, it faced a lot of hurdles because people objected to it primarily to two things. The first was allowing information to also flow to the FBI and the NSA. And uh, people really wanted to try to um, some people wanted to try to keep DHS as the sole means for information to travel to the government. But in working with the private sector, it became clear that, uh, you know, when, when you go outside of Washington, D.C., um, people have their own relationships. They, they work with FBI field offices. Different industries, particularly the, the telecoms, work closely with NSA. And we were trying to find a way to build on those relationships rather than trying to uh, um, steer everybody towards what we were concerned would become a DHS bottleneck. And so um, in the year that, a year later, um, the mm -hmm. Congress succeeded in moving that legislation in part because they established that bottleneck. Correct. 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 Now, in my in my view, they didn't do it perfectly, but that's because of the nature of the compromise. Um, and I know that there have been a lot of issues since then in trying to get people to still, uh, number one, to understand how information should be shared and why information should be shared. And I think, Matt, you've, you've done a lot of work sure. um, with businesses uh, trying to get them comfortable with that. Uh, but it did go a, a long way towards at least establishing the premise that you would be protected from liability for sharing information, including if you went beyond simply to DHS. Uh, that's right. And if I may, uh, Kathleen, uh, thanks. And, and, you know, I think compromise is the name of the game. Nobody 
always embraces that readily. But if we're going to get legislation done, I think that's what we need to do. One of the things that I think we, you know, we, we were going to bat for secure IT, which probably provided the cleanest sharing plus liability and other related protections that was available. Uh, when Lieberman Collins, that bill kind of, uh, uh, suffered from two non-successful cloture votes, I think August and November of that year, not that I remember. Um, <laughs> we realized that uh, one, a few of the elements that could get pulled out, I think if, if I recall, it was Title Seven, that was the information sharing piece. Right. And between about then and 15, it went through various iterations. But the whole idea really was, and it wasn't uh, that... Um, controversial, which is we need a neighborhood watch. We need to uh, kind of gather the techniques, processes, what have you, that bad guys use to go after companies and the government, uh, come up with a way to share those indicators in real time, as well as defensive measures, and kind of have people's backs when they do it. Um, I think we did what we could, and I was pretty pleased with what uh, Capitol Hill developed in partnership with industry. I think we started off with a coalition of about 10 groups, and then I said, hey, let's go to 20 and 30 and 40, and we got up to 50, I think, basically trade associations. And it was a lot of work, but I think maybe um, you know, roughly about two years following, let's say, Edward Snowden revelations, and frankly, the sharing of threat indicators and some of the other things that were related to that didn't go together, but I was pleased to see that we were able to get a lot of different parties, uh, Capitol Hill and the Obama administration on board. And so I think it's been a pretty good thing and, and uh, we're into it five years as of tomorrow. Can you speak to what you've seen over the past five years, Matt? In yeah, terms I would of the say this, um, I think on, on balance, I think what we've seen and what we've wanted to see is in my mind, which is, is if we've got companies that are sharing uh, indicators, defensive measures on a re regular basis, that kind of tells you that they've got a level of maturity. And so in a lot of ways, we weren't really looking to just share for sharing sake, although that was part of it, but to have a robust sharing program where you can send and receive, that tells me that you're, you've got a plan uh, to protect your system networks and you're going uh, kind of above and beyond what most companies have uh, typically done. Uh, one thing that I was just going to flag because I thought it was useful and I was glad that he did it was David Turetsky, uh, I think used to be at the FCC, but is now at the U University of Albany, he put together a uh, report this summer uh, that collected and documented a lot of success stories around information sharing. But I, fr th frankly, my experience is, is most companies and organizations don't come to me and say, hey, we've just been sharing indicators under the CISA program. Hopefully, uh, what happens is companies have engaged in more dialogue, the sharing of indicators. They're also scrubbing any PII. Um, and in the context of maybe solar wind, some of these discussions and so some of these mitigation efforts, without maybe knowing it, have been maybe facilitated because of that law. And I don't know if you really know yet, but uh, hopefully that's a good good outcome. To, and I, would, I would agree with that, Dan. Um, in, in my experience working with, with organizations, particularly ones um, that are um, coming out of or, or dealing with um, uh, data security incidents, um, data potential data breaches, they are, number one, there's not always an awareness of what CISA provides in terms of liability protection. Number two, there's not a, necessarily a sense that um, an organization would have information that the government would want. And then number three, there's also not a comfort level that if you share information with the government that you're going to get information back that might be helpful for you to do what you need to do to defend your networks. So um, I think those things are still very much a work in progress. And I know Matt's done a tremendous job with trying to get the message out there um, for organizations of all sizes in all sectors, but I think there's just still a lot of work to be done. No doubt.
Now, we've focused this largely on a conversation around the private sector, but over the past five years where we've seen some of the increasing um, threat activity and incidents involving cybersecurity has come at the state and local level. Um, in, for, for example, the ransomware attacks that have been occurring over the past couple of years, growing concern about supply chain, which I'd love for us to um, get into a little later. Maggie, I know you speak for the um, for NGA, um, but I know you have a sense of what's been happening at the state and local level. What have you seen in terms of the changing threat environment and how are uh, states and others working with the federal government? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, you know, really appreciate what Kathleen said because that kind of teed me up in terms of information sharing outside of the beltway. You really want to take advantage of whoever people are comfortable reporting to. And so obviously sort of the biggest interest for states is ensuring that the private sector wants to work with them directly. So we have actually seen states pass their own version of CISA bills. Um, and that I think just sort of lends to the voice of, you know, you're able to come to us and you'll be protected from liability, even though, um, you know, the federal bill did preempt state law. Um, but at the same time too, that was also because of a very specific gap that was identified, we wanted to make sure at the state level um, that a lot of times it's general counsel making these decisions about whether to come forward or not. And um, per lawyers rules of professional conduct, um, wanna make sure at the state level that we were being very specific about um, this is a, if this is a permissible sharing of cl confidential client information. So what is the threat level at the state? I mean, I think that uh, we're seeing a, a lot of the same things that the private sector are seeing. Um, obviously, ransomware is a huge concern just because, um, you know, not only does that really kind of stop operations, but if you're a government entity, it, it threatens continuity of government. So we're definitely very concerned about that threat. Um, and continuing forward, just the way that we're seeing that become more sophisticated and not just be about encrypting data, but then also threatening to release it as well. Um, COVID is really underscoring a lot of that where we're seeing kids go virtual. And so really thinking about how do we, you know, protect a whole other set of folks that don't directly kind of come under the purview of the governor. Um, but I would say from the governor's perspective, that's been the biggest change over the past two years. It's not just about how do we secure state IT infrastructure and how do we just think very narrowly about the state network? Of course, that's a very important job and it's, those are doing a fantastic um, job of that. But, um, you know, a governor's not gonna see a ransomware attack take down a, a local government and, and wanna stand back and say, not our problem. Um, so state local partnerships, I think has been the biggest area of growth and states see a role in sort of interpreting some of the information that does come down for, from CISA for their local counterparts. And we've seen sort of a lot of increased interaction there. So I'm not sure if that answered your question, but in terms of the relationship with the federal government, um, you know, states I think are really appreciated any sort of assistance that they can provide as the nation's risk advisor. That's, that's great, thank you. Mark, I'd love to bring you into this discussion. Over the past uh, two years, you've had this, with the commission, it's had this uh, ability to look at a grand strategy and rethinking of, of national cybersecurity um, and where we should be headed. Can you speak to how you're thinking about the challenges that we face and where information sharing fits into this? I think you may be on mute. Thanks, sure. Uh, what, the first thing I'd say is a general complaint about the naming of this bill and then the naming of the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency three years later, yeah. which obviously confuses everybody because you basically have a CISA Act in 2015 and 2018 that's killing Mark, us. we didn't we didn't get it either, but hey, that's <laughs> so it goes. All right. So, um, you know, but looking at it, what, did, what happened was you fast forward from uh, Kathleen's discussion of Senator McCain being involved in 2012 and 2013. By 2016, 2017, there's a level of frustration on the Hill that, you know, uh, what we considered a, a normal strategy of deterrence, you know, having a strong, capable armed forces, a strong, capable cyber command was not preventing cyber activity, you know, below the level of use of force. So we, we weren't getting nation state attacks that took down our electrical power grid. But we were having a lot of um, you know, espionage, whether it was the OPM uh, break in, the, um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the assessment of intellectual property theft over 15 years, the DPRK attack on North Korea, the cyber enabled IO against our um, election infrastructure in 2016 by, by Russia. And then we saw again in 2018, there was this feeling that we needed to do something. We needed to assess what is the appropriate strategic approach. Uh, 
And, uh, and so when we took a look at it in that environment, we thought that you could not just rely on the idea of offensive, you know, of doing persistent engagement and defend forward, which we do value, you know, doing some level of offensive operations, but you actually really did need to build an effective um, cyber defense. And this is unusual for us. You know, I think everyone in this group understands and everyone listening that that cyber uh, removed the geographic advantage we'd had for 70 or 100 years, you know, with the Atlantic and the Pacific and good neighbors and Canada and Mexico that we didn't have to defend our infrastructure. Well, now because of cyber, that geographic benefit's gone. We actually had to defend it. And this is a hard thing. And so what I would say is information sharing fits in there critically. It's one of the four or five elements that you really need to get right. The first is you actually do have to have good cybersecurity. Probably what something we've learned from solar winds is, is that over reliance on external markers, you know, things like what generally what Einstein and, and other intrusion detection systems do, um, there's a risk in that. But you have to have internal anomalous activity detectors running, looking at that kind of thing. But that costs a lot of money. So you have to have a robust investment in your own cybersecurity. You have to have a system that, ex that, that identifies threats and exchanges that information rapidly. So that if you're doing persistent engagement and you come across a tool and you wanna um, make, it, you know, make it so that tool doesn't have an impact on your own critical infrastructure, you have to figure out how you bring that tool back, uh, sanitize how you got the data and push it back out into the uh, ecosystem as something to be uh, um, concerned about. And when you do see an attack, you rapidly develop patches to push them around. So, but information sharing is a critical element of that. I think it goes beyond information sharing. It really goes into analysis. And that's because one of the things that happens now is we push a lot of data around, but the government is not the arbiter of, of everything. And we are not, we don't necessarily own a lot of the systems, own or operate a lot of the systems that the private sector does. So we will see things in, in threat information and not understand what it's, what the risk in it is. But if you were to hand it to someone from Verizon or someone from Southern uh, companies power, um, you know, from their IT, to, they look at it and go, that's a problem for us. That kind of malware or that kind of event will cause X and Y and Z and introduce a significant amount of risk into our stability. Um, so that it's gotta go beyond just information sharing, but it's gotta, it's gotta be this, you know, in our mind, it's gotta be this uh, joint analytical effort. You see little microcosms of this and in Israel and the UK on a very much, much, much smaller scale than we would probably need to run. But what I would say about information sharing is it's critical and it's really the first step into building collaboration. And that collaboration includes this analytical framework. And, if, and you know, kind of importantly, it includes the private sector influencing government. We tend to think of the government influencing private sector as, you know, we're going to tell them what's the right answer. But equally important is the private sector saying, you know, we operate a lot of these kind of systems. You don't operate them in .gov or .mil, but we operate them in .com, you know, in our infrastructure. You, we need to know if malware is being developed against these types of systems. And that needs to somehow be prioritized in our national intelligence prioritization framework, what we collect, what we look for when we're uh, snooping around things so that we get an idea or when we come across malicious software so that our intelligence community has an understanding of what the private sector needs are. And so, you know, you put that all together, that's collaboration, but information sharing is a bedrock element of it. I think it's really interesting that you raise that perspective about collection requirements. One of the um, uh, pieces of legislation inspired by the commission that um, you mentioned when we first spoke was um, involved essentially establishing that type of process where the the intelligence community would go out to the private sector owners and operators of critical infrastructure and um, ask for you know, what their needs are and to try and you know, scope that future collection and, and analysis. One of the things we've heard about information sharing over the years informally from the private sector, but also in government reports from the watchdogs is that often it's, it's not of value. And I think that could really get at um, improving the value of what's coming back to the private sector. I think, um... Dan and, and Mark, I think you hit the nail on the head with respect to what the role, uh, the respective roles are or, or should be. Um, I remember back when Lieberman Collins was, uh, was on the table and then Secure IT, there was a lot of discussion about 
who's really the, the big player or the big force here? And, um, and the bottom line is it, it really isn't the government except in terms of classified information that might be useful and not in the possession of the private sector. It's the private sector that's seeing all of these things come across their networks in real time. Um, and I think that the challenge, Mark, you alluded to it, is, is how, to, um, how to set up that collaboration using information sharing as, as a vehicle, but how do you make each, each uh, entity, um, each, each party um, really uh, um, strong with respect to what they can bring to the table? And I think there's been such a reliance um, uh, or a perspective that the government can solve this problem and they really can't. I think it's got to be much more collaborative than it has been. Yeah, I think that's right. I think one of the things that uh, you allude to the, the you all here is uh, recommendations, I think 511, 512, which may be, I think in some ways, maybe the latest evolution of information sharing where I think the idea is for some of our key sector parties, uh, which are in all our states, to sit almost side by side with some of the governmental professionals where we can learn more about what each other does, what our uh, differing needs are, and use that information to act, hopefully, uh, in advance of an attack. Uh, one thing that I think is interesting, we've now had maybe, what, three major muscle movements on cyber. The first one was kind of Lieberman Collins. Next one was the information sharing legislation. Now I would say collectively the, the, the number of, of bills that Mark and the uh, commission uh, were able to clear and likely will get signed into law, hopefully. Uh, maybe they learned, and I'm, maybe I'll uh, credit Mark with uh, maybe looking at it this way is, maybe the answer isn't a single bill, but multiple bills. So a single vehicle doesn't get uh, shot down, let's say. And if that was the thinking, then I think that was probably the right way to go. One of the things that, uh, at least from a strategy standpoint, I think one of the things that stands out to me is there are recommendations that should give uh, CISA part of DHS a leg up to do more. Uh, I, think the, I think there is still that effort to try to have tighter coordination. I, I continually here. Mark, I'm sure has. Dan, you have. Maggie, you have. Kathleen, you did. Still do, I'm sure, where businesses will say, hey, I'm not getting that kind of juicy information I, I want or need. I'm not sure that a government will ever supply that, but I think one of the ideas is with some of these new recommendations uh, that did, did not clear uh, this year uh, is to get uh, a better understanding of what uh, maybe the IC can go after uh, in partnership with some of our companies. Now, that, now not every organization or company is going to be involved here. Uh, they're going to probably self-select, but I think that may be the next iteration of this information sharing effort. I could be wrong, but I think so. Mark, could you speak to your kind of legislative uh, recommendations? Yeah, that's good. And, uh, and I agree, I agree with with um, with a lot of what uh, Matthew said there. So look, we came up. You know, one thing I loved about um, the K and he's biased towards action. So I said, look, you got one year as a commission, soup to nuts. You know, get your report out within one year, and then work the legislative system. And he said, to make that legislative system work, I'm going to give you four. Well, I'm going to place four active legislators on the commission which is genius, right? Because you actually have, you know, four action officers. And some of them took that very, very seriously. Jim, Jim Langevin, for example, uh, who is happened to also be a subcommittee chair in the House, which is an extremely powerful position versus, say, the Senate. Um, and so we came up with a strategic approach. You can read it in our report. And we described the threat. I do like doing everything unclassified. America writes great law. One of the great things about our great law is that it's unclassified. I think it's, you know, secret law, generally not such a good thing. So we do a good job with this. And he said, keep it. So we did a 15 page unclassified thing that if you're done reading, if you're, if when you're done reading that, you don't think there's a problem then nothing we ever say is going to convince you there's a challenge in cybersecurity. Um, but then we had 82 legislative recommendations that were based on the, on the strategic approach that we recommended. Those 82 recommendations had 52 legislative. We tried to run 36 of them 
through this NDAA. We knew we'd probably get an, an attempt at another NDAA. So we went for 36. Uh, in the end, 29 made it into conference and 25 made it in the final report. A couple got split up and they became 27 provisions. This was easily the most comprehensive um, cybersecurity legislation the Congress has ever passed. Not just because of the 27 we had, there are another 50 cybersecurity in there. Now, 15 or 20 of them are very, very detailed, specific DOD, you know, tweak the RIA stat ones. But there's another 20 to 30 meaningful, you know, whole of government ones in there. So it's a very rich, has its own cybersecurity title, Title 17. It really is good. Now, what I said about that RIA stat's interesting. One of the real challenges is, I think when the team here passed CISA 2015, there's got to be this sense of relief. We did it. it. It's weird. In DOD and the Armed Services Committee, it's a completely different approach. It's, hey, I'll see you in two months. We'll start again. And we'll pass something guaranteed 10 months from then. You know, we, there's, a, a, there's a law every year. Cybersecurity is the kind of mission that requires a law every year. There is no way CISA 2015 was 100% right. It never had a chance to be. And since the 2014 or 2016 wouldn't have been 100% right or 2018, you need to be able to set the rheostat on cyber every year. It is a warfare area. We have to treat it like that. And I know this, this makes several committees cringe in the House and Senate. But if the NDAA is the only vehicle that goes every year, there needs to be cybersecurity for national security purposes every year, tweaking those rheostats, getting it right. I promise you, some of the stuff we put in our 27 provisions, some are have errors. I, I promise you, and that's after being rewritten, but all to the better by staffs. All 27 of our provisions don't reflect what we wrote originally in our report. All had change, but they, uh, they all got better from staff work. But I promise you, they still have error. And one or two kind of suck. I mean, there's one now on threat hunting on the DIB that we have to, which instead of having it the way we said it, which is threat hunting the DIB, it was watered down to, hey, let's talk about having threat hunting in the DIB a year from now. Kind of wish we had threat hunting on the DIB right now. Looking for anomalous activity running inside defense industrial based companies. We might have dis discovered something running since March in some of those companies. So that To me, that anomalous behavior detection is critical. The, the aggressive use of red teams against your vulnerable, critical national security systems is absolutely essential. Now, uh, Matthew mentioned that is one of the CISA ones we did get passed in Folsom. CISA to threat hunt on .gov. A little late for solar winds, but okay for the next time. But my point on this is you need these RIA stats. You need an annual opportunity to improve your cybersecurity legislation. And you need to know you can come back. So you make the deal. You make the deal that's 80%. You go, Gee, geez, we got 80%. That's fantastic. If I got to get 10% of the last 20%, I'll come next year and argue with Matthew about it. Not that we argued with the chamber a lot, but a little, you know, we'll come back and do that. But this, that's how you get business done. And you know, I think, I, I'm hoping they can do that next year. No, I think that's certainly right. I think uh, it is hard to get uh, the bills uh, just so. And I think uh, it's probably a, probably I'd, I'll give it more thought, but I think on balance, it's probably better to try to pursue smaller more narrowly tailored bills, which can be revised more easily down the road. Meaning if they overreach, they don't overreach too much. If they underreach, they can be amended down the road. That may be the best way to go. You know, I just, and, and one thing on topic, one area where we, we, we didn't see eye to eye, but I do think it will come back is the cyber incident reporting uh, amendment uh, that Mr. Richmond offered up. Uh, one of the things we think about with respect to almost any policy law reg is something that I kind of dub a, a three P's or four P's model, which is you want to have some kind of program where there's uh, reciprocity or flexibility in choosing among, let's say, certain cyber standards, programs, what have you. Maybe preemption where applicable, uh, certainly protections, liability, regulation, partnerships. CISA certainly fits that bill, 2015. Uh, price, uh, meaning trade-offs. And I think if anything, I'm not sure we've got all the answers that we would want to have answered with respect to that provision, but it just gives you an example of where uh, that issue is going to stick around and we'll probably be coming back to it. Anyway. 
Mark, can you speak to any of the, what you see as the top items you'd like to see moving in the next Congress that are? Yeah, so you know, first, it, it, and, and I'll follow up one quick thing on Matthew. I say every once in a while, you do have to do a big thing. So National Cyber Director Senate confirmed was our big thing. And with the chamber support and a lot of other, you know, and not people who get along every day, you know, groups coming together and to say, we have to have strategic leadership at the White House. You know, if anything, COVID kind of convinced people that these non-strategic national security emergencies really need pre-planning, relationship building, and, and effective in, initial incident response at the White House, three things that we're missing, you know, last February, you know, that we would like to have for a cyber event and still don't have. So moving on, you know, we got a lot done. I think we really focused on reforming the government and trying to build public private collaboration. The first thing we want to do is go back and get some of the things we missed in 20, um, in the 2021 act on that. One of them, cyber state of distress. And, and I'm still trying to figure out how I lost it, but we, we had a bill and an amendment in both the house and the Senate didn't get in. But this is the idea that early in a casualty, kind of like when FEMA sense it, can see a hurricane's coming, you know, the hurricane hunters out there say one's coming or a tornado's coming and they can, they can start to activate the National Guard ahead of time. When CISA starts to feel like there's a lot going on, I'm getting a lot of incidents, that they could then have a path to bring over um, in the proper titles, you know, uh, um, the Department of Defense assets to help prepare for a cybersecurity incident or get funding, you know, to use private sector. You know, sometimes the private sector has the best response entities ahead of time, much like FEMA does. They use, they use their authorities to both exercise other government agencies, but also the private sector to get them ready. Um, you know, kind of bring things together to kind of get at a problem before it becomes a state of emergency. So that, nice, that cyber state of distress, we think is a big one. Um, we, we failed in the uh, assistant secretary of state for, for cybersecurity and emergency, emergency technology, but we're really close, really close. You can taste that. Maybe the title will change a little bit. That's go back to what it says in the 2019 Cyber Diplomacy Act. But I think we'll be able to get the five corners, the four corners on the Hill, plus the executive branch. And then there's a whole grunch of cyber ecosystem ones. These are the ones about a Bureau of Cyber Statistics, uh, uh, a national certification labor authority, you know, akin to Underwriters Laboratory for cybersecurity issues, um, the you know, uh, national lab centers that are concentrating on specific cybersecurity efforts, you know, uh, increasing the funding and the designation of maybe two, three, four of those to look at ICS control systems, some open software, things like that. Um, we got half of the, we wanted to have a government strategy on how to, imp how to use DMARC, you know, f foundational internet protocols on both DMARC and on DNS. We got the D mark, but not the DNS. We want to go back and get the other half, you know, things like that. that that's about building an ecosystem for everybody that's, that's better. And then finally, the joint collaborative environment, the information sharing environment. Um, we did get in the part about get NKIC healthier. You mentioned NKIC, and I got to be honest with you, Dan, NKIC is a, uh, it's a tough one to get your hands around. It is, it is waxed and waned. I think it's, it's in a downstroke right now. It's not where it needs to be as an information sharing thing. And, and I just hope that the US CERT and ICS CERT that were the backbone underneath it, you know, still have the kind of like gold standard as it comes back up again. But, um, you know, we call it the ICC, you know, really because CISA didn't want us to call it the NK, yeah. um, which is unfortunate. I mean, I think they, they're losing some branding here, but I don't care. Call it whatever you want. You want an effective government organization that is the lead sled dog among government organizations for sharing information. And then also in there, we want to find out how do you do something that was ordered in 2008 and still hasn't been done, which is the eight or nine classified cybersecurity centers and the intelligence community and other agencies that are supposed to be looking at the adversary. How can they change, exchange information seamlessly, not by email, but by speed of light transmission? And right now it's by email and that's unacceptable, especially when you're in a crisis or a casualty like we're in right now. You need to have that. So fixing that and then running over is what's the kind of data lake, like, that's a tough term, but you know, what's the kind of data, the device for bringing in the data from within the .gov, which still isn't done, and between the .gov and the private sector so that the professionals can look through it and understand these are the trends, these are the threats, these are the problems we have. So that's what we're looking at, but you know, starting with those basic ones up front to the you know an aspirational kind of joint collaborative environment at the back end.
it'll be a busy year. And it, if we got it passed, I would call it the second most comprehensive cybersecurity legislation that we've ever achieved. Because I just think this year is with National Cyber Director and COAT, Continuity of the Economy Planning, and a few other things in there, if done appropriately, can really be game changers for how our government's organized and works with the private sector to respond to major cybersecurity. It's cyber incidents that aren't espionage like this, but are uh, destructive or, um, or debilitating, like could have happened. I want to let um, Kathleen and Maggie jump in with their thoughts about what should be on um, policymakers' minds heading into 2021 and any reactions to those uh, recommendations from the commission. Yeah, I mean, so our top ask, and I'm sure this is not going to be a shock to folks, has always been a dedicated grant fund from the federal government for state and local cybersecurity. Um, you know, states, they administer a lot of federal programs. And at this juncture, there's just too many demands on state budgets. And, you know, coronavirus is stretching everything thin. So it, it's it's incredibly difficult to take a look at some of the existing grant programs and leverage it. There really needs to be that individualized focus and attention on it. So, I mean, that's that's our top thing for policymakers. Um, but there's just so much to respond to in what Mark said. Obviously, um, you know, we're of the opinion that the Stafford Act ha sets too high a threshold. So, you know, we're pleased to see the call of distress. Um, and then, Dan, I don't know if you still wanted to talk about the supply chain, but that's something that we've been talking about a lot at the state level, just because we have seen those coordinated attacks and and Texas and Louisiana, where uh, the threat vector was a managed service provider. So, um, you know, that's been something we've been talking about for a while at the state level. Um, we are, of course, states are the laboratories of democracy. So we have been seeing some kind of uh, thoughts there around, you know, if you are an MSP who is um, hired to protect the government and, and especially at the local level, um, there are some bills to consider. Should you have to register with the state? Um, at the state level, a majority of states at this point do have laws that are uh, minimum security standards. And of course the term is reasonableness, which the lawyers love. Um, so what exactly does that mean? We haven't seen enough enforcement to know yet. Uh, and then uh, Matthew, I don't know if you wanna come on this too, but there's a, a schema in, in Ohio that's getting a lot of attention right now to create a, a safe harbor. So if, if companies do uh, yeah. can demonstrate that they met a, a, recognized national cybersecurity framework, uh, something such as you know, NIST or CIS top 20 that would create an affirmative defense for liability. And could that be enough of a carrot to really get people to improve their cybersecurity? I'm glad you threw that out there, Maggie. First, let me say that we were, uh, I think, pretty bullish on a bill that uh, Congressman Langevin and others had put together at HR 80. 48 that would provide some funding to states to help them do cyber better, I think, uh, with ransomware attacks kind of now maybe being eclipsed, at least in people's attention by solar winds. They're not going away. And I think to the extent that local or state governments or, or small and mid-sized businesses in everybody's states uh, feel that pinch, I think that's not good. But either way, funding for states and local governments to do cyber better, ultimately with the private sector, I think is a good thing. Uh, yes, uh, SB 220, I think, as it's known in Ohio, is a good model in the sense that from a negotiation standpoint, I think what we like about it is there's a program, uh, there's a little bit of a regulation to it, companies get to choose from a number of programs that are already in existence, so there's nothing new, new per se, and then there's some level of protection. Uh, Indiana's kind of toying with something that's similar. Uh, I've got thoughts on that, but on balance, big picture, I think it's trying to achieve that ultimate goal. Um, Kathleen, I don't know if you've got thoughts on that, but. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that having something um, that affords liability protection um, is essential. And, um, it, you know, particularly as we see um, state, uh, state laws, state data privacy laws, expanding the ability of consumers to sue. And I think that there needs to be some, some way that businesses can have, A, some clarity about exactly what's expected of them to avoid litigation, and B, um, some incentive or some reward for taking the steps for, for uh, devoting the resources expending the 
the funds to make their system safer, and yet they're still potentially facing liability. So I think that that's important. Um, Dan, with respect to, to other things, um, you know, one thing that, that always concerned me about uh, having an overall coordinator within the White House was what that does to congressional oversight. And I think that, um, you know, it, it's important to have somebody who's accountable and somebody who's accountable to Congress and ultimately to the American people for the actions um, that they're taking. And I think that for too long, for you know, 10 years plus, there has not been accountability within the government. There has not been somebody who's really taken, uh, taken responsibility for the government's um, inaction or poor action in some instances. So I think that that needs to be a central component. On that point, my mind turns to um, what we've learned about the recent attacks. And um, many of us, I worked at HisGAC, and back when we were reauthorizing FISMA, and then in, in 2015, um, there's aspects of the 2015 law that address some um, parts of updating FISMA and the Einstein program. And at the time, everybody knew that it was in the room that the Einstein program wasn't doing what it needed to do. And that law in 2015, we didn't authorize it in 2014, in 2015, that required DHS to come back and look at it and update it within a few years. Um, the latest I saw that they were planning to um, phase in new provisions, which may have stopped the current, what we know about the current breach in 2022. And some of this raises questions about the capability, not just of answering Congress um, through oversight, but the capabilities of the agencies that we've put, vested most of the responsibility. I don't know if you have any reaction. And and the capability of Congress to understand what needs to be done. I think that that's also a core issue. I mean, I know when cybersecurity first uh, started uh, coming up with in earnest on the Hill, we were explaining basic concepts to members. And so there just is, is a lack of knowledge. And, and Mark, Matt, you may have had similar experiences. I think Mark will probably say that a number of members are well-educated, certainly those on the commission. Uh, once you go beyond there, it's probably a little bit of humility to say that uh, like absent staff, I think a lot of members, uh, frankly, some folks in the business community too, of course, are going to struggle with some of these things. And I think maybe we make it too complicated. I think there's going to definitely be some cyber issues here in play, as, as, as everybody knows here. What are the cyber what explains things from a cyber standpoint? I think a foreign policy standpoint, we don't really play as much in that space, but I think these are ultimately going to need to be kind of part of a bigger package. Business risk management questions, right? How did this all happen? You know, one thing I'd love to see that kind of dovetails with CISA 2015 is, you know, my personal view is I'd love to be able to kind of create a safe room where all parties, government and private sector, could enter. Uh, and unless somebody's doing really something really, uh, what, grossly negligent, something just way, way out of bounds, uh, nothing bad happened, no regulatory actions, no liability protections, but uh, no liability, uh, there would be liability, let's say safeguards, uh, but people would be able to speak absolutely honestly, uh, quickly kind of get to the nut of what's transpired and quickly develop remedies. I think too often, I think, as we've already started to see to me, uh, too many discussions about, hey, who, who did what in, 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 in the private sector or government wrong. I think we want to get to uh, red teaming, I think, is it's best understood. Uh, I think we got to learn from some of these things. I'm not sure we're learning from these things. At least I'm not convinced that we are. I think there are shortcomings all the way around, but I don't know if we're really learning where I could go. Here's where we've learned, and we're going to do better next time. I don't think we've gotten there yet. That's just my personal view. So I'll jump in on a couple of issues. One, I, I think Kathleen will be happy. The, the way this bill is written, it's a Senate-confirmed job, so they're going to have to, the national coordinator have to come up. And, and ironically, you know, most of us that worked in the NSC over the years, kind of you have a, a natural like a reaction to that. Um, but the people who are actual national coordinators, we interviewed all of them. A majority, not all, but a majority wanted the Senate confirmed. 
they just realized from their own personal experience that to some degree they could not provide that false thing. And look, Congress, one of two things would have to happen for Congress to get the straight skinny, you know, in one sitting. One is either the executive branch had a national leader, the national cyber director, who was Senate confirmed, or we reorganized the Congress into one cyber committee, you know, we had a cyber committee like the Intelligence Committee or the Homeland Security. And I think that that was, it's in 67 committees right now. It could definitely be in less. It's not going to get to one or two. And in Armed Services and CISI will be the two, you know, and, and they're in HIPSI and, and HASC will be the four committees first in line to stop that from happening, but th they'll do it. So I do like that idea. Um, and I also want to say uh, Maggie was spot on on the, uh, on the IT security funding for state and local. If you think about I could guarantee, you know, I'm proud that my state and my state and county balance their budget. And I'm proud that they keep my taxes low. Therefore, I'm not going to be proud about their cybersecurity investment, because if you balance your budget and you keep your taxes low, cybersecurity being where it plays as a priority and municipalities budgets is not going to be sufficient. It's not going to be the eight or 10 cents of every IT dollar. So I think one of the things the federal government can do is say, if we're giving you money for IT, especially say after COVID, uh, to fix systems that were found to not be IT uh, up to par, you know, for distributing federal funds, then you must spend the relevant amount on IT security. You know, the, the, the important amount. So we're going to work. I know Representative Langevin's already tried it once. We'll try it again to kind of make that happen. But I think IT security in our municipalities, if you think about things our municipalities run, like our water supply, um, you know, one of the most vulnerable systems, I think. And, you know, um, and very hard to protect. And it really needs more investment and it may require the federal government at some point. You know, Mark, that quick quick point on the DOD CMMC, the maturity models, I think we may have an opportunity to see, and you've, I know you've, you've rung this bell, I think rightly so, meaning uh, all DOD contractors will have to meet some level of certification, uh, a maturity level. It's gonna be interesting to see what those costs really are and if we're able to biopsy, as I like to think of it, some of that data to figure out whether or not that CMMC program works, right, for business and government, TBD, but I think that's something, again, we don't really have good data to know, but point well taken. We're about out of time. I wanted to give each of our panelists a time to um, make a few closing remarks. I'll start with you, Kathleen, here. Um, I uh, I applaud what the what the commission's done. I hope uh, I hope there's some uh, success there. Um, Mark, I love your optimism about congressional oversight and a Senate confirmed position. Um, I, I I think having a Senate confirmed position in the White House <laughs> is still going to be an issue. Um, but I do love your optimism, and I I agree that. Um, SASC and HASC and SSCI and HIPSI are going to have to continue to lead um, in these areas, but I think that other committees, uh, Dan, you spent a lot of time on uh, his GAC and, and did wonderful work there. Um, I think that uh, there just is going to have to be a greater effort within Congress um, to try to uh, look at these issues moving forward. And, and I think that uh, CISA needs a lot of improvement. I was not happy with a lot of the compromises, but again, that's the, the nature of the beast. Maggie? Yeah, thanks. And thanks for this. Um, you know, information sharing, no question from our folks' perspective has Im improved, but challenges remain. And um, I love what this panel said about just using that as an opportunity for additional collaboration. So please consider the states in all of your plans to um, further operational collaboration and enhancing cybersecurity. Matt? Dan, thanks and everybody, great to see you all. Um, it was a lot of hard work to get CISA done five years ago plus and everybody here um, made a contribution or at least many of you did and uh, we'll be at it again with re reauthorization in five quick years. Um, I would like to think that maybe one of our strengths is as we see here is debating these kinds of issues our pluses and minuses openly unlike maybe some of our adversaries China, Russia. 
Iran, North Korea, those are our adversaries don't do these kinds of things. And I think hopefully, even though we've got flaws, we point them out and we debate them ultimately, hopefully we're better for it. I think I'd like to think we are. Anyway, thanks for having me. Thanks, Mark. I'll just go quickly and say, I think that the census 2015 was useful. It got the information sharing moving. Um, I, I just think it's one of these things that we, we have to update all of our national security legislation as frequently as you update the armed services um, and the Department of Defense's um, legislation. So, I mean, the, the goal here then is to attack and re-attack every year because the adversary moves the goalposts every year. And I just think cyber, cyber is one of those domains that's going to require it. But thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. Thank you for that. And uh, thanks to each of you for sharing your part of your afternoon with us and to our guests. Uh, we're thrilled to have you and um, hope you all have a nice holiday. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Dan. See you all. Bye-bye.